And when God spoke, bam, something happened. Amen. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And so we're just not up here pointing fingers. Because when we do that, we got three pointing at ourselves. And so this weekend's not going to be about doing this. It's going to be about God's got something for us. Amen. And friends, I'm here to tell you, because it has a nine-letter word on it, Christian doesn't always make it holy. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the first meeting of the Distraction Dilemma Seminar Series. We're going to spend 10 hours together, actually a little bit short of that, but about 10 hours together, and we're going to cover a lot of topics. One of the questions that we get often is, is this seminar uh, suitable for young people? And the absolute answer is yes, the resounding yes. There are a couple areas where it might be a little bit tender for the young ears, um, a little bit overbearing maybe for the tender ears, I should say. And um, I'll let you know when we get to those different messages. But uh, this message and uh, the next message, no problem. They're, they're for everybody to listen to. They're Bible-based. All of it is. We're going to go over um, the Bible. We're going to go over inspired writings. We're going to go over science. And we're going to let the music industry themselves tattletale on themselves. And so we're going to jump in this weekend. We're, we're here because many of us are confused about the idea of what's acceptable to the Christian. Does anybody have that problem? Are anybody here confused about if you're listening to the right thing as a Christian? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I, you know, one day in my life before, I, I was like, yeah, that was me because I didn't understand it. I wasn't raised a Christian. We'll get into that in just a, mo- as a, in, in just a moment. So I didn't know what was acceptable, what wasn't when I became a Christian. I had on one side, I had people telling me this was okay, and other people saying this wasn't okay, and I just didn't have a clue. And so we had to eventually study it out for ourselves. And when we did, God began to open our eyes. And if you commit to spend the next 10 hours with us, I promise you, you won't be sorry. Not because I'm, I'm some great presenter, because friends, I'm just but dust but because God is a great God and he loves you infinitely and he wants to teach you these things so there is no confusion and and hopefully you will not have any tentacles of the devil in your life. And and if this opens your eyes to some of those tentacles, then the Holy Spirit can remove those for you and frankly make your Christian experience a lot more joyful and this will will develop as we go on. This particular message is entitled Overture, Our Personal Journey. And before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer because we want the Holy Spirit to teach us. Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we could come together. We can reason together in the Scriptures in the spirit of prophecy, in science, and help us, Father, to be amazed at what you've put together. I pray that you would teach us, that you would bless us with the Holy Spirit. Father, speak to me so you can speak through me and hide me behind your cross. You've said, if if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Why overture? It's entitled Overture, Our Personal Journey. Well, an overture is a musical term, and it's basically the first part of a, of a large piece of music that kind of gives you indicators of, of what is to come. And so we're going to give you some indicators tonight of what is to come. And what is before you is amazing. If there's a meeting you need to miss, don't let it be tomorrow mornings, okay? Don't miss tomorrow morning. It is absolutely the foundation of this entire seminar. Let's start in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and was void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God, what? God said. God sounded. God sounded. God 
made frequencies. He made vibrations, if you will. And when God spoke, bam, something happened. Amen? He said, let there be light, and there was light. People say, I don't, I don't believe in creation. And, so, and I said, well, I do. I'm a creationist. And people say, I don't, think, I don't believe in, in evolution. I, and, and you know, they'll say the Big Bang Theory. And I say, listen, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. It's just a different one than you. God spoke, and bang, it happened. Amen? That's exactly right. Anyway, let there be light, and there was light. God sounded, and he moved things with his voice. God said. That was very powerful. Sound vibrates molecules. And when God spoke, molecules stood fast and obeyed their commander. There's massive creative power in music and in sound. And Dr. Hans Jenny, a Swiss physician and natural scientist, he photographed plastics, powders, liquids, and other inorganic substances as they were being vibrated with sound. Here's what he saw with his own eyes. He found that inorganic matter changes shape and forms geometric patterns that can come to resemble living creatures such as starfish and human cells. Sound moves matter. So these images are simply inorganic substances, powders and things being vibrated by frequencies and they come into pattern. That's, that's fascinating to me. Look at that. We'll blow this up for you so you can see that, how intricate that is. Look at that star-looking thing in the middle. Isn't that amazing? Did you know sound moved matter? Look at this one. This one, this just amazes me because there's so much geometric shape, and yet sound is doing it. Structure. Dr. Hans Jenny said himself in his research, he concluded that sound has a direct influence on our human biology and thus influences our health. And this is very interesting, but we'll come back to this because we're going to talk a lot more about the physiology, the mental aspects, and the spiritual aspects of music. Now, when God spoke, when He sounded, when He created, He created beauty. He created harmony. I love that picture. He created radiance. And he created structure. And of course, he created symmetry. And so when God creates with pure sound, it creates gorgeous things. There was perfect harmony in the entire universe at one time. I don't know if you know that or not. But before sin, there was perfect harmony. And that's a musical term. And we'll learn about that later. There was no note of discord, and we'll learn about that word as well. What does discord mean? We'll learn about that. There was no note of discord to mar the celestial harmonies until one chose to pervert the freedom that God had granted. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God. Lucifer, son of the morning, chief covering cherub, holy and undefiled. Have you ever thought about that? That actually before Lucifer became, became Satan, he used to be a holy, undefiled, wonderfully happy creature. In fact, the Bible talks about his pipes, talks about his singing voice, and how amazing it was. And in fact, he himself was the choir master of heaven. And of course, if you're the choir master of any group, you really need to know something about music, amen? Yet he indulged the desire for self-exaltation. He ventured to covet the homage due alone to Christ. Now the perfect harmony of heaven was broken. Each one of these sentences are key sentences you can find in inspired writings. Revelation 12, 9 says, There was war in heaven, and that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So what does that mean for us as human beings? That means he's here. That means you better look out because there is a devil that doesn't love us, and he wants to take us out, and he's got a bunch of cronies with him. 
and they don't want to do anything that's good to us. Are you with me? That's what the Bible got. I shouldn't say that. I should say, are you with the Lord? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 52. No longer free to stir up rebellion in heaven, Satan's enmity against God found a new field in, the plot, in plotting the ruin of the human race. He would change their love to distrust and their songs of praise to reproaches against their maker. Thus he would not only plunge these innocent beings into the same misery which he was, himself was enduring, but would cast dishonor upon God and cause grief in heaven. 1 Peter 5.8 says to be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, someone that doesn't like you, someone that doesn't want anything good for you, the devil, as a roaring lion. Does it say he's a little kitten? Meow. No, of course not. It says that he is a roaring lion. And he's seeking whom he may devour. And there's so many ways that the enemy is accomplishing his purpose today. He's sly and he's deceitful. Looking around at our world, you would most likely agree that there's a vast playground of sin. That he's cleverly packaged to try to trip us up. Music is one of those things that he has cleverly perverted and deceitfully packaged. The great adversary Satan hates you because God loves you. So these are some key things we need to understand that the devil doesn't have your best, best interest at hand. He hates you because God loves you. He's still alive and well, and he's perverted everything he can. He wants to accomplish one thing, and that is to distract us from Jesus. That's all he wants to do. He wants to cut off the connection that we have. He wants to just sever it between us and our maker. And however he can distract us, whether it's movies, whether it's music, whether it's money, whether it's ministry, whatever it may be, however the Lord, the devil can distract us from the Lord suits him just as, just as well. And there are just as many distracting things out there as there are people on this planet. And I just heard recently that we just hit 7 billion. And some say, well, not yet. We have two more months before we hit 7 billion. Okay, we've almost hit 7 billion. That's incredible. Just the, the explosion of the people on this planet. And so the devil just continues to invent more and more distractions for all of those people because the last thing he wants is 7 billion Christians going to heaven. Music is of heavenly origin. The Lord thy God will joy over thee with singing. God himself sings. In fact, we're told that over every repentant sinner, God himself sings. There's great power in music. It was music from the angelic throng that thrilled the hearts of the shepherds on Bethlehem's plains and swept around the world. So God chose to use preachers to go out and preach and say, Jesus is being born. The Savior has come. Is that how he did it? No. He said, I want some angels to go out there and start singing a song. I think that's very cool. That God chose music to announce the birth of Christ. So there's nothing wrong with music for the Christian friends. But not everything that's labeled Christian is Christian. And we're going to expose that this weekend. It's swept around the world. It is with music and songs of victory that the redeemed shall finally enter upon the immortal reward. So we'll be singing our way right into the pearly gates. Music is a blessing. God created music. He loves music. He himself sings, as we just read. He gave music to us as a gift. And he knows how music can move us and affect us. And there's some thoughts out there that if music affects you in any way that is inappropriate, friends, we're going to blow that out of the water. Because the reality is music is made to affect us positively. The problem is sometimes we're listening to the negative stuff as well, and it's affecting us too. When used properly, though, music can draw us 
closer to God, helping us to live in harmony when it's used properly. When wrongly used, it can bring disharmony in our relationship and can become a distraction. And this indeed creates a dilemma for the Christian. And this seminar is entitled what? The Distraction Dilemma. Now, let's define distraction first. Distraction, a diversion. To divert the eye or the attention, of course, from what? From God. A drawing apart to disorder the reason. So what the devil wants to do is to distract us, disorder our reason, so we don't even think on godly things. Now, what's a a dilemma? A dilemma is a situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two or more choices. So what the devil does is he tempts us, he distracts us, God's calling to our heart, the devil's pulling our heart, and now that creates a dilemma for the Christian. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about here? Oh, it's the Christian experience. And sometimes it gets long. But you know what? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And that's Christ in us. And the devil is out there. And what that means is we can overcome every snare of every distraction of the devil if we're connected to Christ. To be, uh, a choice has to be made between two or more alternatives, a predicament, a problem, or a struggle. So therefore, the distraction dilemma is any diversion presented to the Christian that could draw his attention away from God. Anything that will draw our attention away from God. So, yes, we're talking about music. This is a music seminar. But friends, don't just think like this this week. Don't put the blinders on and just focus only music because we're talking about music. You can apply the principles we're going to learn to every area of our lives. So this is the big picture. There are two sides at war for our souls. God trying to save us from the devil and the devil trying to distract us or separate us from our God. Because God desires to save us and to protect us from Satan, he warns us and he gives us clear direction and guidance regarding his will for our lives. So now we're going to jump into our story. We thought it would be good to to let you know where we came from and what role music played in our lives. We'll give you a little bit of our testimony to give you a little bit better understanding of who we are and where we've come from and what music has done in our hearts and how we used it in our early lives. So I'm going to invite my wife up, my lovely wife, Kobe. This is my wife, Kobe, and she's going to take over for a few minutes. But I want to say something before we turn it over to her. If you have any questions this weekend... Don't think you have to just come to me with them because Kobe has been here right by my side studying all this material out and she has a command of it maybe even better than I do. And so while she only has a small part up here and giving her her part of her story, just because she's going to be in the background here doesn't mean she doesn't know what she's talking about because the reality is God has blessed her with a lot of wisdom on this subject. So Kobe, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I don't mind having that, that small part because uh, I think you're much better and more comfortable up here than I am. <laughs> but, you know, growing up, I didn't know any of this stuff that was talked about, that Christian was sharing. Had no idea that there was this great war, this battle going on for our souls. And, you know, I didn't know this because growing up, um, I was not raised in a Christian home. There was um, a spirituality in my home. Uh, but there was no religion, per se. It was a very good home. I had a wonderful home, and actually my parents are here tonight, which is pretty special because that doesn't happen a lot, and so that's neat that they're here with us. But, um, you know, Jesus, God, the Bible, these kind of themes and stuff, honestly, it was something I never even thought about it. It just never really even entered my mind. It wasn't anything that was um, a main part of our existence. I had friends that of course, were Christians and would go to church and occasionally they'd have some event and they'd invite you to come along, but there just was not a spiritual pulsing going on in me when I was growing up. So 
even going to church, it wasn't something that um, when I would go with them that ever really drew my heart out to the Lord because uh, I was just there as a social thing and, you know, I'd leave and go home and do, do my own thing. You know, I was taught, though, because we did have um, a good home and I was taught to have morals and respect for my elders and a lot of, as I've learned now, a lot of Christian principles I was definitely taught growing up just didn't know at that time that they were founded in God's word and where they came from. But as uh, I was growing up, music was a huge part of my family's life. Literally, I can remember thinking back that music was on from the time that I woke up in the morning. I think our alarm clocks went off with music going and it stayed on until, you know, we went to getting ready for school and getting, you know, driving to school and going throughout the day when we came home it was back on again and pretty much I just remember it being on all the way up until we went to bed at night it was just such a part of my life you can see here even in this picture that was a gift from my grandma and that's a, a Michael Jackson thriller t-shirt and that was oh I love that shirt I think you know it probably had holes in it by the time uh, my mom finally just had to throw it away so I just thought that was the coolest shirt ever you know um, Pretty much, I can think back, most of my memories growing up are wrapped in music somehow. Even now, when I think about going to my aunt's house, I can still remember uh, either Earth, Wind, and Fire, because that was always playing over there, so I always linked that, or Kenny G. It was like always the songs that were there, and those are the things that I remember. And I think about going to my grandma's house, and one of my, my grandma's it was always the big band music that was playing, or there was a one special, uh, just kind of funny because you mix big band, but with David Lee Roth, but there was another David Lee Roth song <laughs> that was um, one that I think a family member or something had given to them for an anniversary thing or something. I don't even know where it came from, but anytime I think about going to my grandparents and being over there and us all hanging out in the back room together, it's just wrapped around music and, and that being part of our experience growing up. Um, as a teenager, I really lived out my emotions through music. It became, at that point, um, more than just entertainment listening. It was something that became really personal to me. And so during the time of my teenage years and being a young teen, I knew better than if I get upset with my parents or have some problem than to go and scream and yell at them or something. So, you know, you just head off in your bedroom and crank up some song, and I could just live out my angry, rebellious feelings like that. I would just get pumped up and whatever I was feeling, I would live it out through that music. And same kind of thing if some of you can probably relate, if some boy broke my heart or didn't like me the way that I liked him, then, then you know, I would put on some sad song, talks about, you know, broken hearts and drag out my pain. <laughs> to really think back on it, I thought, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> But it would make life a lot harder for myself because uh, I wouldn't be able to just get over those emotions. I would just want to live and wallow in them. And it was just not good. But music was my sympathizer. It's, uh, you know, it was my defender. Music was, you know, my comforter. If somebody else didn't see my point of view, I knew I could find something that would agree with me in my music choices. It was just what, what I could turn to. It's where I could go. And it's pretty much what I turned to to get me through whatever was going on in my life. Um, as things in my teenage years, you know, as most teenagers, you've got a lot going on in your lives. And mm, absent from the Lord, you don't always know how to deal with those things. And even though I had a wonderful relationship with my parents, uh, even there, I didn't know how to work through a lot of the different things inside of me because this is what you do. I mean, <laughs> when you just grow up, with music and these different things in your life, that's the stuff you just, you see everybody turn to, that's just what you turn to. And so that's all I, I knew to do at that time. There was um, a lot of music, like I said, that was played in my house. And I had a very eclectic taste in music as I was growing up. It ranged from Faith Hill to Def Leppard. I listened to Madonna and Depeche Mode and Alabama and Belle Biv DeVoe and the Cranberries and Queensryche and, Mariah Carey and Joe Satriani, Earth, Wind & Fire, Jodeci, Journey, Avril Lavigne. And I absolutely, it's probably my top genre of music that I absolutely loved, I absolutely loved soundtracks to movies. 
And I think I probably love that because, you know, they have a lot of emotional energy to them. A lot of times they're, they're made to carry a story. And so, you know, you can identify a lot with pieces of music that are from movies, and I definitely did, and I really enjoyed that. By the time um, Christian and I had met, as I was late in my teens when he and I met, I had pretty much drawn away from a lot of the friends and things that I had in my life. Um, was just kind of at a place where things just were kind of falling apart. I wasn't sure what I wanted to be doing. It just, everything seemed kind of chaotic. And uh, music at that time was really my only constant. It's um, the one thing that I felt never changed. I could count on it whenever I needed it. And so it was just that one thing that stayed with me. And I just kind of attached more to it. Growing up with music the way that I did, I never realized that my dependence on music was so strong. You know, I didn't perceive that this was an imbalance or anything. I mean, most of my friends probably would feel the same way. You would share different stories about songs. And, um, you know, growing up, I had, you know, even at that time, it was like so many of my memories for then were, um, there were so many happy things that were linked to it as well. I mean, on my 16th birthday, I remember coming down the stairs and my parents and my brother were down at the bottom of the stairs. And as I came around the corner to start coming down, they had turned on um, the song, Happy Birthday, Sweet 16. And they're down at the bottom and they're singing it to me and I'm coming down. And so, I mean, I just, I have wonderful memories wrapped up in, in music. But not until I became a Christian um, did I really see how important music was to me and that it probably was crossing over into an area that wasn't as healthy. And I definitely learned that as I continued um, to try to develop a, re a relationship with Jesus. Uh, I was so used to going to music when I had any kind of struggles going on inside my heart, um, or if I was discontent or anything, that that was where I turned to, that it was really, really hard for me to learn how to stop and put my trust in, in God and to pray about those things or try to talk to him about it because to me, I didn't feel like I got an immediate response. You know, in music, of course I was getting whatever response I wanted, <laughs> but I was getting an immediate response or so I thought, you know, it wasn't a lasting changing thing. It didn't do anything to heal my soul per se because of the, the things that I was listening to, but it would put those little band-aids on and it would help me to to cry or to laugh or to be angry or whatever I wanted to be right then. It would just help me to go through it and I'd work through it and then I'd be able to, to go about my day and do whatever I wanted to do. So, you know, as we became um, stronger in our walk, I should say, it became more and more evident the more you're around different Christian people that there was, you know, certain music you probably shouldn't be listening to and there was music that we could and Christian's going to get into that a little bit, but I was really struggling with it. And I just decided I got rid of a lot of the music that we had because people that knew more than I did said this was the devil's music <laughs> and it was worldly and it was not appropriate for the Christian. And so I thought, okay, I don't know why. And they typically say, well, what is it about it? And well, the lyrics, and I could understand that. I mean, you know, you can kind of see some songs are kind of a given that they really are not Christian. And so I could understand that. But beyond that, there was a lot of music that I was like, well, I don't really see that there's much of an issue. I, you know, it's just, I'm in love. And so I can sing about stuff that's, you know, happy and being in love or, um, you know, I have struggles in my life. So it's okay to, to have this song that maybe deals with some of those struggles. So I just didn't understand it. And I would put the music away because we'd always been taught from the beginning when we came into a Christian faith, and I appreciate this principle, that if you don't understand something, it's better to err on the side of caution than to just go, well, I don't understand it, so I'm going to embrace it, you know? It's like, if I don't know, and there's still some, uh, I'm not sure if this is okay or not, then it's okay to just say, well, I'm going to step away from it, and I'm not going to have it in my life right now, because I really don't know if it's okay. There was enough questioning in my mind to let me know that it might not be okay, <laughs> So we would just choose to not have it. But that pull was still in my heart. And so I would have seasons of wanting to go back to that music that I really enjoyed. 
So as we started studying this out, and it really came about because a lot of people had asked us to over the years, um, I finally said, okay, <laughs> if we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it all the way. <laughs> because I'm one of those people that is probably the, the worst when it comes to, because I like my music. <laughs> and so he could talk about something with me, and I would say, well, I kind of see that, but. And but what about this? And oh, but what about this statement? Or what about the, you know, people say this. and. I was always the one who was coming up with the things that I'm sure drove my husband absolutely crazy at times. Because, and I wasn't that I was arguing for what I wanted, but I just felt like I didn't know how to make a stand on what the truth was in my life. I just, I thought, I don't know if drums, are all drums bad? I can't see that. I can't see that all drums are bad. And so I can see where sometimes they're not great. So I just had all these questions that I felt weren't being answered all the way. They were just kind of generalized. Somebody would give you these light answers. And so that's what made us really dive in and study this hard. And we'd get somewhere and we'd go, okay, I can see to there, but what about this? And so it goes a little further. So I'm hoping that you will have that same experience that I had going through this. Um, that now I can stand up here and feel much more confident that I know why I'm making the choices that I have. Do I still have pulls towards that music that I liked before? Absolutely I do. I mean, you can't go to a store and you can hear certain things. But you know what? I know so much now, and it's really, it's, I know it's the truth because I've studied it deep enough that I can have confidence to go, yeah, it's okay, but I don't need it anymore. I don't need to have it controlling me. I've got this, and I'm good with the Lord now, and so I can choose with God's help to find those things in those pieces of music that can help me and help, you know, my spiritual walk, because we're all different. We all have different makeups and we all have different things that we struggle with um, and God knows those things. And so when he can help us find our platform of truth to stand on and help us to see what's acceptable for us and our walk with him, it's just a really empowering thing and it feels good. And it's not so difficult to stay away from those things because I don't question it anymore. So I'm hoping that you'll have that experience as we go through this weekend together. And I want to go ahead and invite Christian up, and he's going to go ahead and share a bit of his story. And uh, I will see you later. Thank you. <laughs> so music is something that I also used, as Kobe did, to sometimes enhance my feelings and sometimes to help try to mask them. I was raised in a non-Christian home and I don't even know, I mean that, I don't know what happened, but he was a cute little guy. <laughs> I love that picture. I go, that was actually me on a little horsey, you know, the, you know how they had the horses on the little springs and you'd go like this on it? I'm like, man, they should make those. But someone probably got sued. I was raised in a non-Christian home, and my, my parents divorced when I was seven years old. And my, my mother and her first marriage, uh, they were non-Christians. There was no Christianity in our home. Uh, we, there was really no spirituality at all. I mean, while Kobe had some kind of like this moral compass and different things, there was just not that going on in my home. And so I was really raised almost by myself and with my brothers because we were latchkey kids. And we would go and let ourselves, we'd go, ride our bikes to school with our lunch bags and we'd go to school and then we would come back and let ourselves into the, um, into the house and lock the door behind us and do all of our chores and our parents would come home in the evening. Uh, my mother was in need of male approval. You see, she was, she was 19, excuse me, she was 16 years old when she got pregnant with me and 17 when she had me and her father was never available for her emotionally speaking and so she was seeking for emotional um, connection with different people and she was doing that looking for that in men and so she got pregnant very young and I was the result and so my mother was young she didn't really know how to raise any children she was just a child herself my father was 19 years old, and he uh, had no Christian pulse in him either. And like I said, they divorced when I was seven. My mom remarried, and our nightmare actually started. 
my mother remarried a man that was heavy-handed from the beginning, but he wound up being extremely abusive for all of us. He was abusive to us mentally, emotionally, physically. And uh, my mother really took a large brunt of that. And music was in my life. I mean, it wasn't maybe quite as much as Kobe and in her family to where it was on all morning, but every time we were driving in the car, there was music. And my mother, I won't even mention, oh, I just got the songs in my head. Anyway, uh, all these songs would just race through my mind and we'd sing all these. And my mother loved country music. And maybe that's where my aversion to country music began. I'm not quite sure. But... Um, while I don't cast people down that want to listen to country, that's fine. It's just not one of my favorite genres. And perhaps because it's just linked to so many bad memories, maybe that's the reality. Um, so the reality for me was it was a bad home. And I would mask my pain through uh, music. So if I felt hopeless and I felt like I just... I, you know, I was going to be beaten again, or I had just gotten beaten again. I'd go into my room, and I'd turn on my record player and put on those big old headphones back then. And they, they didn't go in the ear back then, uh, young ones. I didn't know if you knew that or not. But you'd put these things on, and I'd sit there and listen to my record player, and I would listen. I won't even tell you the different songs, but I listened to all these different kinds of songs that would just kind of pump me up and animate me, and I'd just be like, yeah, I'm not a loser or whatever. And then other times I'd play the sad music because I was just like Kobe. And so I was either like enhancing my emotions, which did me no good, or I was like altering my emotions that really wasn't doing me any good either. The, on, the reality I found as a Christian now is that the only person in the universe that can help a broken heart is Jesus Christ. And I didn't get that because I didn't have him in my childhood. And I tried all kinds of things. We worked in, late into the night, and you can see, um, let's see, what side am I on there? I'm on your right, and uh, these are my two brothers. So we each had, uh, my parents had all three of us. My first set of parents had all three of us uh, siblings. And um, our nightmare continued on until I was a sophomore in high school. And then out of high school, I joined into college. In fact, I found another distraction of all things. I found a distraction in the theater arts. And this is where I began to actually embrace becoming different characters. So not just living vicariously through this, um, this music, but now another distraction for me was I could go and become these different characters. So I could escape my pathetic life and my reality and I could become this empowered Dracula or whatever I was playing in the play and you know I was really good at acting from the beginning do you know why because I was acting my whole childhood acting like everything was okay when it wasn't acting like everything was fine and dad didn't just beat me and I had to put on a smile and act like everything's fine because someone just rang the doorbell. So I had become a professional actor as a child. Put on a facade. And I know some of you here and some of you that are watching around the world have experienced lots of pain in your life. And I've tried every kind of thing out there from entertainment to drugs to alcohol to everything else out there. And nothing healed my heart until I actually was introduced to Christ. And that's coming up. So my mother remarried. She remarried to a good man. Praise the Lord. Third time is a charm. She found a good one. In fact, I believe my mother and my stepfather are watching right now. And I love you and I'm glad that you are. I began a TV and business career, and right out of college, actually while I was in college, I was going to a junior college, um, I only went for almost two years. I didn't quite get any degree, so I am Christian degreeless. As a friend of mine says, Dan he says he's Danny degreeless. I'm uh, Christian certificateless, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, but the reality is, uh, I jumped into television production when I got uh, while I was going to school, while I was going to college. And I was learning some things in the classroom, in television and communication and media and radio. And one of my professors says, you need to get out there and you need to actually just start 
um, and in the, in the field if you really want to learn some things while you're going to school. Well, I got out there, I got a job, and I was going forward, and so I began television production at the ripe old age of 19 years old. And I loved it. I got the bug for it, and I really enjoyed it. And I wound up uh, finding a new escape, and that was taking people on a journey in television. And so while I still had all the music, I still had the theater in my life and all this stuff, I started some businesses. And you'll see here, I've got a business partner uh, there in the middle, and that was one of our, our workers. He was a manager of a, a magazine that we had. And things were going well for me um, as a young man. And we had started a, co a company, and it grew into three different companies. We had over 30 different employees, and it was going very well. And then I lost everything. And I just needed more distractions. So after I had lost everything, um, I just sunk myself into TV, into movies, and into music. Because here now, my whole life seemed like it was spinning out of control, and I was only 21 years old. I listened to all kinds of music. I listened to Michael Jackson and Foreigner, Air Supply, Guns N' Roses, Beastie Boys, ACDC, Motley Crue, Kiss, The Police, Run DMC, Public Enemy, Billy Idol, Christopher Cross and the Cars, and many, many more. I listened to a lot of junk is the reality. And it wasn't doing me any good, but I'll tell you what, it, it served its purpose, if you will, not knowing that there was any other alternative in Jesus. So our story continues, Kobe and my story. I was baptized, and so was Kobe. And literally overnight, I went to work for the Lord. This is a number of years now later, when I was invited by a friend of mine. His name was Danny Vieira, and he ran a health institution, and he well, ran a health ministry. And he and I had become friends prior and had done some video work together and stuff for him. And when my life was falling apart, he had come to me and said, um, I, actually, I, I visited California and went to him and said, you know, things aren't going well. And he thought, this is great. And I said, no, it's not great. And he turned to me and he said, Christian, I think it's great because I told you a long time ago, I believe God has a calling for your life. And he had said those words to me. And then as a result, he uh, began to say, you know, I could really use a guy like you. And at that point, I could do graphic design and layout and television production and um, he said, I could really use a guy like you in our, in our ministry. And um, as the story goes, as history is, I accepted the job. And before you know it, I went from 100% world to 100% working for God overnight. I mean, it's an incredible story. And I was told that you, I couldn't have any TV or secular music because I was living in a house that was bought with God's money and God built the house. So he didn't want anything evil in that home. And as a worldly, secular guy, guess what I did? Okay. Why? Because I was ready for a change. I had tried just about everything else on this planet, it seems like, but I hadn't tried Christianity, and Danny was a Christian. And so I started working for a health ministry. I had a, my brother-in-law actually said to me, what do you do in a health ministry? Sit around, pray all day, and eat carrots? You know, I was like, I don't know. I've never worked at one. I'll let you know. You know, I had no idea. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I knew, interestingly enough, that God was op opening a door for us. What was interesting was when I was in that home by myself, I was not married. I did not have TV, did not have music. I mean, I had some music, but I had no worldly music and stuff like that. Not even worldly magazines. I mean, I actually went on a full-blown detox, like King Nebuchadnezzar for seven years, right? I was even, even eating grass while I was juicing it, but anyway. I had a bunch of quiet time. No worldly distractions. Guess what? I started hearing some. It was the voice of God. If that seems awfully dim for you, it's because there's too many distractions in your life. So God began to speak to me, and since it was so quiet, I heard him. I started reading and studying and praying and asking God to help me trust him. See, you have to understand, as an abused child, not only abused mentally, physically, spiritually, but every way that a human being can be abused, I was abused inappropriately by my biological father. And so as a result, for me to look at God the Father as a father figure was difficult for me to wrap my brain around because every father I had had 
or father figure had let me down or had hurt me or had violated me. So you understand, huge hurdles here. Lots of baggage. And so what God did for me is he gave me some beautiful Christian music. He didn't take away music. I got some beautiful Christian music. And it actually began to minister to my soul. And through that beautiful music, and through the quiet time, and through reading my Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I actually was led into a covenant relation with Jesus Christ. And my friend Danny then baptized me. In fact, that's a picture of him right there, baptizing me in his swimming pool. And then Kobe was baptized some days later. And I found the song, People Need the Lord. Anybody ever heard that song? It's one of my favorite songs, probably because it was really the first Christian song I ever heard. And that song ministered to me, and I would listen to that song, and it would make me cry, and I'd think, oh, I need the Lord too, and I'd play it over and over and over again, because it was indeed ministering to me. And I no longer felt a desire to escape. It was interesting. I didn't want to run away anymore. I was able to just look in the mirror, if you will, and say, okay, here are your issues. The Holy Spirit had been revealing them, and now I wanted to deal with them, not just be distracted and they never go away, not just numb them with some music or a little bit of entertainment and they never go away. You see, God wants to uproot it and cast it off into the deep. Yet we want to hold on to it, or if we cast it off, we go, go fishing for it. I was an empty person, and I had serious problems. And then I stepped into a new place with music. Danny heard me singing one day. I was just singing, People Need the Lord, I think it was actually. And he said, hey, man, I didn't know you sang. And I said, oh, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I did a little bit in musical theater or whatever. He said, I think you ought to sing. I think you ought to, to, to sing. And maybe, maybe you go with me and sing before I preach or whatever. And I was like, yeah, right. So then before I know it, I'm up there singing before he speaks. Um, Danny's very persuasive. Uh, in fact, if you're watching, brother, I love you. And I'm, I'm glad you're able to watch. Um, the reality is that Danny uh, encouraged me. And he helped me to see, hey, well, maybe I could do something for God, too, and not just work in the office. And so I never ever thought that it was going to be anything really grown into anything. And so I just started singing a special music before. And then I had two special music. Then I had three special music. And then eventually I had four. And eventually it went to a second hand. And I had six special musics I could sing. Anyway, I began to embrace this whole idea. And... Um, People started to come up to me and saying, oh, do you have a CD? I was like, no, of course not. Don't be crazy. <laughs> my wife, actually, Kobe eventually became my wife. And that's a story for another time. In fact, we might even do a DVD on that. It's pretty awesome what the Lord did. And so we get married, and now Kobe moves into the detox home where I'm living. And I tell her, we can't really listen to that stuff here and we don't want to because God has other neat things for us. And so she boxed up her stuff and put it in the closet while it called to her all the time. Am I right? I'm right. I know because I saw the struggle. I don't know how it is. If you don't like get rid of the stuff that God tells you to, but you like leave it there, it goes, Christian, I'm over here. Oh, you know you want to listen to me. You know you want to watch. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not nuts. You know what I'm talking about. And so we removed a lot of things out of our life, and we were excited about that. Over the last 15 years, we've had a lot of setbacks. We've had a lot of triumphs. We're not perfect people. We're just trying to be like Jesus, and we're not that way sometimes. Other times, it's like, wow, I had victory. And so we're just not up here pointing fingers because when we do that, we got three pointing at ourselves. And so this weekend's not going to be about doing this. It's going to be about God's got something for us. Amen? And eventually, we left. Uh, I, I, Kobe had went to work with uh, Danny as well. And eventually, our ministry, our ministry begins to develop. And this is actually a picture of me mixing my first um, album. Uh, actually, excuse me, a demo CD. We were, had a manager that wanted to shop us around and start... Uh, putting us out there in front of different um, managers and, and record labels and stuff to see if we could be picked up as a Christian artist. And so not only does our ministry develop, but our family begins to develop. And this is my little Tyler. 
In fact, this is one of the ministries I was working at before, and that's little Tyler there with the headset on, learning how to run cameras even back then. And then we had our Micah. And uh, Micah is actually, both of my children are here, and they will be on cameras at different times throughout the weekend, and that really excites me. So eventually, uh, we were, um, I was led to Christ, and then I had the opportunity to bring Kobe to Christ. I started singing for God, like I said. I created that demo CD. And, and as I shared it around, we had one side of our fam- of people saying, wow, I really like that, that's beautiful. And then we'd share it with other people, and they go, oh, that's of the devil. I'm like, I have four songs that are Christian songs. And I'm like getting slapped in the face by these well-meaning Christians saying, yeah, that's beautiful and wonderful. No, that's of the devil. I'm like, it's the same four songs. How could it be beautiful or of the devil? And, and so I would say, well, what do you mean it's of the devil? And they go, oh, you know, that's contemporary music or whatever. I'm like, uh, okay, what do you mean contemporary music? Well, that, that's worldly music. Worldly, why? Because it's, it's contemporary. What do you mean by contemporary? Well, that's worldly. I mean, they would just have this like, like, give me something here. Amen? And so we, we, were, we couldn't figure out what was going on while we had these two sides on the same demo CD. So we just erred on the side of caution, like Kobe said, and I never sent out the demo CD because I didn't know if it was appropriate or not. And I just wanted to please Jesus. So what we realized is that we didn't understand music, and frankly, most Christians didn't understand music. As we had conversations with so many different Christians, we realized nobody seems to know what they're talking about. So that's why this whole thing came about. And so this is our family today, and that is a beautifully photoshopped image of the four of us. Moving on to 2 Timothy 2.15. Eventually, we applied this text to our life, and we engaged in it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And what we began to study amazed us. Here are some of the things that we began to discover. Dr. Masaru Emoto, he found that when you have beautiful music and words, that they form crystalline structures in music. Do you see that image up there? What's that look like? That's, that's, that's not a snowflake. What he did is he took a cylinder of water, and as it was being frozen, he put some speakers with what he called beautiful music, and they spoke beautiful words. And as they spoke beautiful words and listened to this beautiful music, it formed that. Did you know that sound could do that? Did you know that muse, beautiful music even has structure in water? Here's another. Look at that one. Isn't that incredible? It's just music aimed at dumb water. How does it know to become structured? Interesting. Look at this one. That one is so, if, you, if we could zoom that one in, it's so, it is so intricate, it's amazing. It looks like it should be hanging on a Christmas tree. He also found that discordant tones and negative music form chaotic patterns every time. Look at that. Same cylinder, same water, aiming discordant music and negative music formed chaotic patterns. Look at that. There's just nothing there. Yet, you aim some beautiful music at it, it creates snowflake-looking things, and you, create, you aim discordant music, and it creates chaos. Let me ask you a question. I don't know. I don't have a study on this, but let's just think for a moment. What percentage of bod- water are we in our body? 80? 70? 80%? I wonder if we could even be messing up some structure in our body with the discordant tones. I don't know. It'd be an interesting study. But if it can do it to a dumb cylinder of water, it could probably do it to a dumb guy here. Are you with me? Here's another picture. Now, we're going to listen to a couple music samples here. Look at this. What do you suppose, what music do you suppose created that structure right there.
that music created that first image. That's crazy, while it's being frozen. Is that cool, or are you guys falling asleep, or are you, like, amazed? Okay, good. I want to make sure you're amazed. You're on the amazed side of it. Praise the Lord. Now, what do you think made this one? How about Mozart's Symphony Number no. 40? Is that cool? How about this one? Any guesses? How about Beethoven? That music makes that? That's cool. Do you think God knew that? Of course. What do you think made... Uh-oh. Is there any beauty or symmetry there? Uh-oh, we're going to listen to, what do you think? Different kind of music? Yep, you're right. Well, yeah, it looked like it almost started to have a little structure. That's right, sweetheart. And all of a sudden, like it fell apart. Here's what made that one. What are you giggling about? Interesting. How about this one? What do you think made this one? That one's pretty messed up, huh? No. Some people want to say that music doesn't affect us as human beings. And by the way, this weekend, we're going to blow that out of the water. If there's a meeting you're going to miss, by the way, don't let it be tomorrow. The 11 o'clock meeting is absolutely foundational to this entire seminar. You need to be here at 11. Bring your friends, by the way. What's interesting to me is that science has proven that since our bodies are 90% water, they are actually physically affected by the sounds, the words, and the music that enter our body. Every cell in our body has actually a frequency. I don't know if you knew that or not and systems actually have harmonies within our bodies. And these systems within our bodies can, and our mind can be supported and even assisted or hindered and negatively altered by the sounds and the music that we experience. So just looking at this, thinking that we are so myriad and that we are so complex, just looking at this simple little illustration, do you think there's probably a better choice of music right, just right here? Uh-huh. While what we share is going to be amazing, it will not be rocket science. Song has wonderful power. Messages to young people, 291. It has the power to subdue rude and uncultivated natures. Power to quicken thought and to awaken sympathy. So to promote harmony of action and to banish the gloom and the foreboding that destroy courage and weaken effort. That's awesome. What we're see being told here is that music has the ability to subdue rude and uncultivated natures. But friends, if it's the wrong kind of music, it can promote rude and uncultivated natures. Are you with me? It can quicken thought or it can pervert thought or it can slow thought, and we'll show you the science to back that up. It can awaken sympathy, or it can deaden it. It can promote harmony of action, or disunity. It can banish gloom, or give you gloom. So we need to be careful. 1T506. When turned to good account, music is a blessing, but it is often made, oh, a little wing, tiny little thing that Satan uses. No, that's not what it says. Here's what it says but it is often made one of Satan's most attractive agencies to ensnare souls. So people said, Christian, you're sitting here doing a music seminar. You've talked about music. You're just chasing after the devil's bunnies. Well, friends, if music is one of the devil's bunnies and it happens to be one of the most, what? Most attractive agencies to ensnare souls, then we better chase this bunny. Amen? Sixth century Christian philosopher Ancius Bothius wrote this. Music can both, so in other words, <laughs> this has been known for a long time. Music can both establish and destroy morality. Uh-oh, Christian. 
for no path is more open to the soul for the formation thereof than through the ears. Therefore, when the rhythms and the modes have penetrated even to the soul through these organs, it cannot be doubted that they affect the soul with their own character and conform it to themselves. In other words, by beholding with our ears, we become changed. Right? If we're listening to ignoble, if we're listening to uh, dark, desperate, sexual, sensual music, we will be imbued with the same character. That's how it works. Yet, friends, the beautiful flip side of that is if we're listening to things that are ennobling and elevating and edifying, we're changed by that as well. Now, you were handed out a music quiz, and if you're watching this on DVD, you can go to our website and don't download it now. This music quiz, hopefully you've already filled out part one, where we take a little bit of information from you. Part two is an audible quiz. I am going, now understand that this is, a, this is subjective, I understand, because all of us experience music from our experience, and we'll get into this as we go as well. But there are 12 different songs that we're going to listen to quickly. They're very short samples. It will be hard for you to discern sometimes because they are short samples, but I want you to circle do you believe this song is a Christian song? Do you believe it's a secular song? Or, I'm not sure, I just don't know. Or, hey, I know the song. Or, I have the song. Circle whatever applies. So, for instance, on song number one, you could say, oh, that's definitely Christian, and I know the song, and I have the song. You could do that, for instance. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to go through, and we're going to play some samples, and I want you to tell me whether or not this, these songs are Christian Whoa. Whether or not these songs are Christian or secular. Are you ready? Have you got your writing utensils? There will be a test later. Okay, here we go. Song number one. Is this Christian, secular? I'm not quite sure. Oh, I know, and I have the song. Here we go. Song number one. For the girl on the ground in the dark Every beat of her beautiful heart Was a labor of love. I know it might be a little difficult, but go ahead and circle your answer now. Do you think that's Christian, secular, or you're unsure? Okay, song number two. Are you all ready? Song number two. All right, that might be a little harder to discern, but do you think that one is Christian, secular, or you're unsure? Mark your answer right now. And by the way, we're going to hand these in, so don't, don't look at your neighbors. Don't call out what you think it is. Okay, song number three. So is that Christian? Is it secular? You're unsure? Whatever it may be. Are you ready for song number four? Raise your hands. You ready? Are you awake? All right. Here we go. Song number four. And in every situation, he has proved his love to me. What are you laughing about? When I lack the understanding, you know that guy. more grace he gives to me. All right, was that Christian Berdahl? <laughs> I'll give you one. That was me. And if you write secular, we're going to have words. All right. All right, song number five. Let it breathe. Your life ain't over. Not unless you want it to be. It, it just, I'm sorry. It, I, I, okay, okay. So, song, moving on. Song number six. Everybody caught up? We make moves. You know how I do when the team come through. You know what we about to do. We gon' shut it down. Shut, shut it down. We gon' shut it down. Shut, shut it down. 
what it is. What it is. You know how. All right. Christian, secular, or you're unsure? Song number seven, right? And she knew it was love. It was one she could understand. He was showing his love. And that's how we heard his hands. All right. Song number eight. I need you like a burning flame, a wildfire untamed, to burn these walls down. I'm only yours now, I'm only yours now. All right, you got your choices made? We're almost there. Song number nine. Hold up, wait a minute. Poor guy's a love addict. Okay. Doesn't, sounds like he's a little distressed in that song. Okay. So uh, song number nine is that Christian secular, you're unsure, I know, uh, or I have the song. Circle all that apply. Sing with the tuneful spirit. Sing with the cheerful lay. Praise to thy great creator while on the pilgrim way. That was kind of obvious, huh? Make your choice. That was my friend, by the way. Song number 11. There is a reason we're doing this. There's a reason. By the way, do any of you guys, while we're going through this, are you starting to, some of the songs, you, you kind of feel something? going on a little bit, like a little physical reaction maybe. Some do, some don't. I'm one of those guys that, man, it like just makes me just like go crazy. I, I'm just telling you. And there are, there, there are actual scientific reasons, and we're going to talk about this this weekend. There's reasons this stuff happens, okay? All right, last one, song number 12. Have you logged your answers? Okay, now, real quick, before we're done here, I'd like to ask you each a question. Song number one, who thought it was Christian? Raise your hands. Okay, we have some takers. Um, how many of you thought it was secular? Raise your hands. Okay, about half and half, all right? So obviously we don't know what we're talking about on song number one. Song number two, how many think that song number two was Christian? Raise your hands. Okay, we have a couple. How many think it was secular? Raise your hands. Okay, more of you thought that. How about song number four? How many of you thought that was Christian? Verdal? Okay, very good. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, song number seven. How, how many think that was Christian? Some of you, okay. How many of you think that was secular? Raise your hands. Man, we got half there again, so apparently we don't know what we're talking about on that song. Song number 10. How many think that song number 10 was Christian? Raise your hands. How many think that song number 10 was secular? Raise your hands. Okay, last song here. Song number 11. How many think it was Christian? Some of you, okay. How many think it was secular? Raise your hands. Okay, uh, do you see what's happening in this room? This is what's called a microcosm of what's happening in the greater Christian community. Because some say, oh, that's Christian. And some say, oh, no, that, that was secular. The reality, friends, is this. Every single song you just heard had a Christian label on it. Pick your jaws up. Oh, 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 I mean, the whole room went, oh, what do you mean? No, it, it's in a Christian section of the bookstore. Every song right there is Christian. It has a Christian label on it by Christian record producers, by Christian singers. In fact, let me drop another bomb on you. Guess what? All of those songs were reported to me and encouraged for me to listen to 
by most of your young people on Facebook. Hello? Do I have your attention now? You see, friends, while some of us may not like to listen to some of these samples or whatever, and throughout the next couple of days, we're going to listen to some sam samples and we're going to go, why do we have to listen to this? Eventually, our ears will get tuned to understand what some of the challenges are in this music that the world produces. And friends, I'm here to tell you, because it has a nine-letter word on it, Christian doesn't always make it holy. It doesn't always make it something that we as Christians can listen to. Do, does that make sense? All right. My son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that wilt, thou will incline thy ear unto wisdom, not the worldly music, and apply thy heart to understanding, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. When we incline our ear to God and not the world, even the worldly Christian music, and friends, it's out there. Not everything labeled Christian is indeed Christian and acceptable for us to listen to. And this weekend, we will expose some of these things. It's going to be an amazing journey. I hope you stick with us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we depart from one another, we ask that you would be with us, you would guide us with the Holy Spirit, and we ask, Father, that you would please let us know what is the acceptable will of God in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and thank you.